All right, folks, welcome back. It's time for our next video on the six millimeter WOA load development. The last video we shot a ton of groups. We shot a bunch of bullets, a bunch of powders, and I'm not gonna give you some in-depth recap. It would take 20 minutes to do so. So I'm gonna assume you know what happened in the last video. We're gonna hit the ground running. And the first step is gonna to be to prep some brass. I've got about 125 pieces of fire formed brass that we formed in the last video and shot them. Well, now they're all fire formed. So step number one, I want to decap all of these with a universal decapping die. I'm going to briefly wet tumble them. Then we're going to anneal them and resize them. And after resizing, we'll check their length, see if they need trimmed. And yeah, that's kind of the first steps here. So let's get to it. So I'm using a Redding universal decapping die to pop out the primers. Not that much interesting to say here. Okay, so our brass has spent about an hour in a wet tumbler, followed by about an hour and a half in a dehydrator to make sure everything was dry. And we're ready for annealing. Now, there's some debate as to whether you should anneal before you resize or after you resize, or even if you should anneal at all. That's a little bit outside the scope of this, uh, of this video series, but I am going to anneal these before I uh, resize them. And my thought on this is, you know, they've been formed, they've been necked down, they've been fired once. So they've had a bit of a rough life up to this point. I wanna go ahead and anneal them. I wanna soften up this brass before the next operation. I haven't done enough serious testing with annealing to say whether this is the best best course of action or whether it doesn't matter, whatever, who gives a crap, this is the way we're doing it today. Now, what we've got here is my salt bath annealing setup. I've got my PID controller, which controls the temperature of this lee. It's actually a lead furnace, but it's actually full of molten salt right now. You can see it's at 900, 930 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about 500 degrees C. I've got a video on this setup, so if you're interested in salt bath annealing, we talk about it at length in that video. But the plan is to dunk these down into the salt for about three seconds. And back to what I was mentioning a few minutes ago, I was very careful to make sure these are completely dry. Like they spent a good amount of time in the dehydrator because you don't want to introduce water into molten salt. So what we do is we turn on a metronome app on my phone and I've got it making a little ding dong noise every three seconds. Yeah, you hear that? So that's what we're going to use to time our dunks. And we're going to get gloved up here a little bit because this salt likes to splash around a little bit. I've got a bucket of water down on the floor that I'm gonna dunk the cases in after they get pulled out of the salt. I've removed all of the powder and primers and stuff from the bench because 900 degree salt doesn't mix well with those either. So, all right, now it's time to shut up and listen to my metronome and get ready to dunk these guys. And that's it right there. So this is what the cases look like coming out of the salt. The neck, shoulder, and then down the case just a little bit has been submerged in the salt. You can see a little bit of dis discoloration, but not quite as much discoloration as you see with like flame-based annealing. So that's what they look like. These guys are ready for resizing now. So I'll go ahead and get the rest of these guys annealed and we'll move on to the resizing. All right, so our annealed brass is ready to go for resizing. I have sprayed them all down with some lanolin case lube, so they're lubed up and ready to go. For a sizing die, we're going to use the standard Redding full-length sizing die. And if you remember from the last video, we don't want to screw this guy all the way down. It sizes our brass more than we'd like. So let's start out with it, and that's probably a third of a turn off the shell holder, and we'll take some headspace measurements to get it dialed in. I'm using the Hornady headspace comparator tool, using the A330 insert to measure from the base of the brass to the shoulder. So 1.363, and that's a piece of star line. This is another piece of star line that I'm getting about a 1.364. See if we can find some Hornady. So this piece of Hornady is reading 1.362, so one or two, one or two thousand shorter than we saw with the star line. Not totally surprising. This is another piece of Hornady that is also at 1.362. So I'll tell you what, let's set the, the fulling sizing die to bump this measurement down to 1.360 if we can. So the Hornady will get bumped about two thousandths and the star line about four thousandths. That, that assumes they both come out of the die with the same measurements. We'll, we'll see how that goes. So this first piece is a piece of Hornady. Let's see what this measurement gets us, or this setting gets us. So we haven't touched the shoulder yet, 1.3625. So we'll tighten down the die just a little bit. Move on to the next piece. This is another piece of Hornady. Doesn't look like we've, we're touching it yet. So no movement so far. So another adjustment and another piece of brass up through here. 
Hey, that looks just about perfect. 1.360. Let's do another piece of Hornady and see what we get with this one. That one looks perfect as well. Good. So let's move over to some Starline and see what number it gives us. 1.360. Good. Let's try another. And that one's right on the money as well, 1.360. Excellent. So both brands of this brass are coming out of the die at the same measurement, which is just perfect. Let's see how long these cases are. If you remember, our trim length is 1.680 and our max length is 1.690. So that one's still short, 1.675. That is Starline. Another piece of Starline is 1.674. So it looks like the Starline stuff is probably going to be nice and short still. Here's a piece of Hornady, a little bit longer, 1.6. 7.9 and the next piece of Hornady is a bit longer 1.687 so we might have a little bit of trimming work to do here once we finish resizing and speaking of that that's what I'm going to do so I just measured the length of all of the pieces of brass these three pieces are the longest ones in the whole group and remember 1.6 nine zero is our max so we're still a couple thousand short with that one and the other two are just about the same that one's actually 1.685 and the last one's 1.688 so i think we're just going to roll with it for one more firing after the next firing and resizing we'll go through and trim them but for now eh, let's just forget about it so the next step, I'm going to take my resized brass. I'm going to throw it back in the wet tumbler for like 15 minutes to get the lube off of all the cases. And then I'm going to thoroughly dry them and we'll move on from there. Okay, so the last three operations I want to do before we move on to primer, powder, and bullets are I want to deburr the flash holes. Now, both this, this Hornady brass and the Starline brass has got pretty clean flash holes. So we could definitely get away without flash hole deburring. But, you know, just in case, you know, one or more of them have a burr on the flash hole, I want to go ahead and catch it. I'm using a Frankfurt Arsenal case trim and prep center. I've got it all set up here. Might as well just go ahead and do it. I also want to deburr and chamfer the case mouth. That's pretty much it. So flash holes outside of the case mouth, inside of the case mouth, and we're ready for primers. All right, so our brass prep is complete. Cleaned up, sized, annealed, all of that crap. It's ready for powder and bullets. I even went ahead and put our Remington seven and a half primers in here. It's just powder and bullets at this point. So let's move on to that. Now in the last video, we shot a bunch of bullets. I think we shot 11 different bullets and we've reduced that bullet list down to six. It was five, now it's six. But this first segment, I wanna talk about four in particular. They're all medium game uh, hunting bullets, which is kind of what we're trying to focus on. We've got the 90 grain Nosler Ballistic Tip Hunting, the 90 grain Hornady ELDX, the 90 grain Sierra Game Changer, and then the 95 grain Nosler Ballistic Tip Hunting. Now, one thing I wanna change up for today's test is with the Sierra Game Changer. I wanna shoot it at a 2.3 inch overall length, which is our magazine length. In the last video, we shot it at 2.4 inches. So it's a pretty big change, 100 thousandths of uh, overall length, but it would be really nice if this bullet fit in our magazine because in the last video, it shot the best groups out of anything. So I'm hoping things will stay that way once we switch to the shorter overall length. Now with this bullet, that puts the start of the ogive, you know, the end of the bearing surface of the bullet, the beginning of the ogive, either right at or just barely below the case mouth. So I'm not sure how this is gonna work out. We'll just have to give it a try and see. So these four bullets, which we're gonna shoot first, we're gonna shoot them all at a 2.3 inch overall length. And we've narrowed down our powders to four for the time being. So I wanna shoot one of our test powders with each of these bullets for the first range trip. First, IMR 8208 XBR, we're gonna shoot it with the 90 grain nozzle ballistic tip. I believe we shot this combination in the last video. Our charge weight was 26.0 grains. Our velocity was 2740 feet per second. I wanna see if we can get this up over 2800, maybe to 2850. So working up from our, ma from our max charge in the last video, which was 26.0, I wanna work up in two tenths of a grain increments. I just wanna load one round at each charge weight. I wanna see how far we can push it before we hit pressure. I wanna see how much powder we can get in the case before the compression, you know, before we're really compressing the powder too much. A lot of times if you're shooting loads that are too compressed, your bullet seating die can 
kind of mangle the bullet. I want to make sure we don't run into that. So that's, yeah, that's what we're going to do first. So with this combo, I'm going to weigh out one charge. I'm going to seat that bullet. I'm going to, you know, make sure that it felt okay and wasn't too compressed and then move on to the next one, weigh that charge, seat that bullet. So it's going to be weighing one charge, seating one bullet until I either run out of case capacity, which I think will probably happen, or I'll probably load up about 10. So like 26.2 all the way up to 28.0, but I don't think we'll get that far. Does that make sense, man? I, I feel like I'm, I'm choosing the, the most confusing way to explain this possible. Next is the uh, 90 grain Hornady ELDX. I want to shoot it with Vitavori N540. Now in the last video with N540, we shot 27.0 grains. We were already above 2,800 feet per second, 2,818 feet per second to be more specific. So we're not going to be able to go much further with, with N540, but I want to go ahead and push it a little bit. So we'll probably load up three or four rounds with that combination. Now the 90 grain Sierra Game Changer, I want to shoot with, with AR Comp. Now in the last video, I shot 25.0 grains of AR Comp. Did I shoot it with this same bullet? Hang on. Yes, I did. So I shot 25 grains of AR Comp with the Game Changer at 2.4 inches of overall length and we didn't have any pressure signs at all. So with the shorter seating depth at the 2.3 inch overall length, that's going to bring our pressures up. So we're going to have to be on our toes there a little bit. I've been trying to decide whether to go ahead and load some lower charges or just, you know, stick with 25. I think I'm just going to stick with 25. We'll just see what happens. It's only one round. If we need to pull a bunch of bullets later because I loaded stuff too hot, so be it, whatever. So AR comp and the game changer at 2.3 inches of overall length. We're going to start at 25.2 grains and we'll see what happens from there. The 95 grain nozzle ballistic tip, we are shooting with accurate 2520. I shot accurate 2520 with a 95 grain bullet in the last video. It was a burger. So we are switching bullets up a little bit here with this powder, but that's okay. I still think we're in the right range as far as charge weight. So we'll start with 27.2 and work up from there. So that's the first range test I want to do. And then we'll come back, evaluate what we saw and pick out some loads to shoot for some, uh, sh shoot for some groups. Now, moving forward, we're also going to be doing additional testing with the 107 grain focus. There it is, the 107 grain Sierra Match King. It's a different animal. We're going to save it for later. And there's another bullet I just picked up. It is the 103 grain Hornady ELDX. Now, unfortunately, this thing is a beast. It's as long as the 107 grain Sierra Match King. So we're going we're gonna to play with this guy later whenever we're playing with the 107 Match King. All right, is that it? That makes sense? As I mentioned, I'm just going to be weighing one charge, seating one bullet, weighing the next charge. I need to make sure I've got my head screwed on straight here so I don't make any mistakes. And it's boring. So we're going to skip over this and I will just see you guys out on the range. All right, so it's time to get started. I've got a target at 100 yards. The groups won't really matter too much here. And I even considered not even hanging a target, but it might be useful to watch, you know, at the point of impact shift or something like that as we shoot these first pressure test loads. The gun is a complete upper from White Oak uh, Armament with a 22 inch barrel, 24 power Vortex Viper PST scope. I've actually hung a brass catcher. I usually don't run with these when I'm filming because I like to be able to re re you know, report on the ejection patterns or if we have a malfunction, I like to be able to see it on camera. But I need to run down every single piece of brass as we shoot it and I thought this would make life a whole lot easier. So we're running a brass catcher. Velocity is coming from our lab radar chronograph. So let's just, yeah, let's get started. The 90 grain nozzle ballistic tip is first with IMR 8208XBR. Our first charge is 26.2, but all the way up to 28.0, which is the, the highest charge I loaded. I don't know if we'll get there. You know, we, we may run into pressure problems before we get to 28, but the case fill was not excessive. Like, I, I you know, we're not all that compressed here with 8208XBR, which is good. We got room to move up as far as we want to. The gun is completely cold right now. So at least here for these first couple shots, a little bit of uh, point of impact shift might be from the barrel warming up. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. First up, 26.2. Now that piece of brass looks great, but unfortunately the stupid chronograph didn't trigger. So I relocated it, moved a little bit closer to the barrel. I almost always shoot suppressed and we're not shooting suppressed with this gun. So I'm a little bit out of my comfort zone as far as the uh, chronograph goes and getting it to work the way I want. Now, unfortunately I don't have any cider ammo loaded up or I would just shoot some of that and get my chronograph issues straightened out. I don't know, let's move on. 26.4 is next. All right, velocity on that one was 26.95, which in the last video with 26.0 grains, I got 27.40. So we're a little bit lower on velocities. I did switch cans of 8208XBR. This is a different lot number than we shot the last time, but that's a pretty big difference. It's a little bit cooler today. 
The temperature is about 80 degrees. And in the last video, I think it was about 90 degrees, but 8208 XPR is not really terribly temperature sensitive. Certainly not to that degree. All right, moving right along, 26.6. Okay, huge jump in velocity, 2769. And I did get a little bit of an ejector mark on that piece of brass. Nothing scary yet, no burrs. So let's go ahead and shoot the next one, see what happens. Okay, that shot was 2766 and it had similar looking brass. So let's go on, 27.0. Okay, that was 2772 with similar looking brass. Let's move on. Okay, 2794 and still nothing super scary on the brass. It just dawned on me, the difference between the last range trip and this range trip is that now we're working with fire formed brass. So we've got a little bit more case capacity than we had in the last video. So these velocity numbers are gonna be maybe just a touch lower. That makes sense. The other thing I failed to mention earlier, all of these are in Starline brass. The Starline and the Hornady have almost the same case capacity, but the Starline did have just a tiny little bit more. So that's what I wanted to do these tests in. All right, moving on, 27.4. All right, big jump in velocity there to 2850. And our ejector swipe is a little bit more pronounced there. The smart move would probably be to stop right now, but at least this one time, like 8208 XBR, I wanna go ahead and really push this thing and see what we can get. So not that smart, but let's move on, 27.6. Okay, 2840 that time with similar looking brass. Next is 27.8. 2881. All right, let's go ahead and finish it off. 28.0. All right, 2875, and we didn't blow our face off. So that's it for 8208 XBR. Let's move on. Next up is the 90 grain Hornady ELDX with Vitivori N540. We already hit 2,818 feet per second in the previous video with 27.0 grains. So this one, we're starting with 27.2. We'll see how it goes. All right, 27.73. So we lost a little bit of velocity that time as well. Not a big surprise like we talked about earlier with the fire form brass. This piece of brass actually looks just great. So let's move on. Hopefully I'll load it up high enough here with N540. All right, so a little bit on the last round and this round definitely our ejector marks are back and we've got our velocity back up to where it was. So two more to go, 27.8. and 28.0. Oh yeah, that one took a pretty hard swipe. So it looks like we loaded up high enough after all. Next is the 90 grain game changer. And this is the one we've got to keep our eye open because we shortened our overall length by a hundred thousandths. So hopefully we're not in big trouble here from the start. First up, 25.2 grains. All right, velocity still looks good, 27.49. And that piece of brass looks really good, so awesome. I was afraid we had started too high. Let's move on. So this is the best looking brass I've seen at these velocity levels. We're ma we've made it up to 2844, and the brass looks perfect. That's awesome, 26.0 is next. All right, so this is pretty shocking. We're, all, we're up to 2,871 feet per second and the brass looks perfect. Let's keep going. All right, 2,925 feet per second and I finally have a little bit of an ejector mark on the brass. So these numbers are crazy, but there's only one round left to shoot. We might as well shoot it, right? Good grief, 29.45. That is bonkers, and the brass looks awesome. Well, that was pretty wild. One more powder to test, and that's accurate 25.20. 
We're testing it with the 95 grain nozzler ballistic tip. First up, 27.2 grains. Now this is a five grain heavier bullet, so I don't think we'll be breaking into that 2800 region, but let's find out. 27.2s first. All right, so the first five are pretty boring here. Pretty good looking brass. A few minor shiny spots, but nothing to freak out about. Velocity's up to 27.30. So next is 28.2. All right, bit of a velocity spike there. 28.05, that shot. But the brass still looks pretty good. All right, 2844, and definitely got some ejector markage on that one. So we'll get back to the bench now, and I'll show you guys an up-close look at the brass. My immediate thoughts are, holy crap, AR comp. Crazy high velocities with the 90-grain game changer. Are we going to be able to get those numbers with the other bullets? So let's get back to the bench. Let's look at some brass, and then we'll load up some more rounds. All right, let me see if I can show you what's going on here with this brass. I tried to mark all of the shiny spots with little red dots and stuff. The first two rows here are 8208 XBR, which is what we started out with. And I'll show you the last couple pieces once we got up to around 2,850 feet per second-ish. And let me see if I can adjust my camera. Nah, I can't really find a good camera setting, but hopefully I can get you seeing what I'm seeing. Got a mark from the ejector and then the other side from the extractor. These last couple had marks on both sides. The primer still look good, nice and rounded and the rest of the brass is fine. So that's the only sign we've seen so far. And the great news is this brass really seems to be holding up great. Like these, they're not raising up any burrs on the brass or anything. And at least here for this second firing, all of the primer pockets felt great with all of this brass, both Starline and Hornady. So this is, you know, pretty much the worst we've seen and it's not all that bad. So that was 8208 XBR. I, you know, once we got past 2,800 feet per second, that's when the bad things started happen, that, happening. That's with the, the 90 grain bullet. Next was Vitavori N540, and we only had the, the very first shot, we only shot five with N540. The first shot was okay, but the next four showed some signs of ejector and extractor marks. Again, nothing terrible, but they were there. They were definitely there. And then we moved on to the surprise of today's video, AR Comp, which was just amazing. Here are the last three loads. This was the 90 grain game changer. This is 2,888 feet per second up to 2,945 feet per second. The last one, the very highest charge with the highest velocity didn't have anything at all. Like it looked perfect. The two right before it, one of them, it just kind of had some bright spots around the middle. It didn't even have an ejector mark. It just had a bit of a shiny ring around the middle near the primer and the primers otherwise looked great. And there was one piece that had a little bit of a smear. So AR Comp looks like an amazing powder for this cartridge because those are pretty silly velocity numbers. Really good stuff. Now, last up was Accurate 2520. Our last two pieces had some shiny spots there. Yep, a little bit, just very lightly. Remember, this was with a 95 grain bullet and these velocities were 2800 and 2844. So not too bad. All, all of the powders did okay. They all got to what I would consider good velocities from the little bit I know about this cartridge. But AR Comp really seems to be the place we need to start narrowing in on until we have a reason not to. My questions are, so how would AR Comp do with the 95 grainer? Yep, the 95 grain nozzle ballistic tip. I wanna load up some of those. Could we get a 95 grainer to, I don't know, maybe 2,850 feet per second comfortably with no brass damage whatsoever and acceptable accuracy? I don't know. I want to find out. The other thing, so the Sierra Game Changer at 2.3 inches, we didn't really get much good accuracy information out there here in these first shots. So I want to reload up some of the hottest charges with AR Comp and the Game Changer and see what our accuracy looks like. Hopefully the, you know, the precision is still gonna be there at the 2.3 inch overall length. 
And can we uh, recreate the excellent numbers we saw with the Game Changer with our Ballistic Tip and ELDX? These are extremely different bullets to the Game Changer. The Game Changer has got the longest ogive and the longest boat tail, which means it's got the shortest bearing surface. So these Ballistic Tip and ELDX and even the 95 grain Ballistic Tip, these have got longer bearing surfaces than the Game Changer. So we might see pressure problems sooner with these than we did with that one. But then again, this is the longest bullet. So we've got more effective case capacity to work with on the other three. So our charge weights will probably need to be a touch higher to reach the same velocity numbers we're getting with the Game Changer. I don't know, that's what we need to, to load up and find out. So let's get it back out to a normal view. Let's come up with some load data. All right, I think I got it planned together. Here's the load data. Now we just shot up to 27.0 grains with AR comp with the Game Changer. And 26.6 is where we started seeing ejector marks. So let's, let's shoot to 26.5, just short of that. We'll shoot three groups with each bullet and we'll do three tenths of a grain increment. So 25.9, 26.2, and 26.5 with the three 90 grain bullets. That'll give us a good opportunity to see what's going on, see what the differences are in velocity and accuracy and whatnot between our three bullets. Should give us a good idea of where we're at. Now, the problem is I'm running out of Starline brass that's prepped. And that's something else really kind of need to characterize exactly what the differences are between the Starline and the Hornady with the same load. So with the Game Changer, I want to shoot the 25.9 grain load in both types of brass. That way we can have a look and see what the velocity differences are. I expect the Hornady's going to be a little bit higher with just a touch less case capacity should, should uh, raise those velocities just a bit. I think, I don't know, we'll find out. Now with the 95 grain ballistic tip, I want to shoot all Hornady because, well, I don't have enough Starline. And I think what I want to do for charge weights on the 95 is just drop everything down one grain. So we'll shoot 24.9 up to 25.5 and just see what happens. So I've got 65 powder charges to weigh out and bullets to seat. So I'll do that and see you guys back out on the range. All right, folks, time to get back to it. We have got a couple of reloading problems that I need to talk about, but I was running out of daylight, didn't really have time to do it at the bench. I really need to get these shot today. So we'll deal with it after. But with bullet seating, I'm having a little bit of problem with seating stem fitment. And I think it even goes back to some uh, sizing stuff. So we'll talk it all out later. I bring it up now because I need an excuse. If we see a couple flyers or some groups that kind of get screwed up by one or two shots that just don't seem to want to group with the rest of them, I'm afraid that might be the source of the issue. But we'll worry about that later. We'll see what happens here. Everything is the same as it was before. The target is at 100 yards. The dots down there are one inch in diameter. Our white oak armament upper has got a 22 inch Krieger barrel. Velocities are coming from a lab radar chronograph and we're ready to get started. First up, the 90 grain Nosler ballistic tip at 2.3 inches of overall length, the first load is 25.9 grains of AR comp. Let's see how these velocities compare to what we saw with the game changer. Oh, you know, another thing I wanted to do, let's bring the scope down. Some of the shots were going pretty high earlier. So let's come down a minute and a quarter. Yeah, whatever. Just kind of want the, the rounds to land a little bit lower. And I forgot to arm my chronograph because I'm an idiot. Okay, that should work better. So that first shot went left and screwed up the group a little bit, but that's okay, the gun was completely cold. The velocity is a little bit lower than we had seen with uh, the Game Changer, 2784. With the Game Changer, we were just a little bit over 2800 feet per second at this charge weight. That's good, that's fine. I would rather be low than unexpectedly high. Brass looks okay, so we're moving on. 26.2 is next. Okay, so that group's a little ugly. 
We're up to 2821 and I am seeing some ejector marks on the brass, but nothing scary. So let's move on. 26.5 is our last test with the 90 grain ballistic tip. Okay, so that was a good way to finish it. That was our best group, 2840 feet per second, our best standard deviation number of 8.4. So that's good. Definitely did see, uh, start to see some ejector marks on the brass with that load, but nothing terrible. So we're moving on. Next up is the 90 grain Hornady ELDX. Same exact loads. We're starting with 25.9 grains of AR comp. All right, that's not a terrible start. Moving on, 26.2. Okay, last up with the ELDX is 26.5 grains. All right, so that ELDX definitely seems like it's wanting to shoot. We made it all the way up to 2,882 feet per second, and the groups weren't terrible. So here's what I'm gonna do. We're 30 shots into this. I'm gonna let the gun cool down for a little bit, take a little break, and then we'll move on to the game changer. Okay, break time's over. The gun has cooled down. It's time to move on to the Sierra game changer. I'm pretty excited about these groups because this was our best shooting bullet in the last video, and I'm really hoping the accuracy holds together at 2.3 inches of overall length, which is what we're shooting. 25.9 grains of AR compass first. Uh, that's not a terrible start, but it's not quite what we saw in the last video. Brass still looks good. Moving on, 26.2 grains. All right, so I screwed that up. That was not 26.2 grains. That was actually the 25.9 grain load in the Hornady brass. Now the difference we see there is 21 feet per second faster with the Hornady brass. And a couple pieces of the Hornady brass did have just the slightest little bit of an ejector mark on them. Nothing crazy, but just a little bit. So that's kind of what we predicted, right? A little bit less case capacity, a little bit higher pressure, a little bit higher velocity, but not much. So yeah, kind of what we expected. All right, now this time, this is 26.2 grains in the Starline Brass.
All right, so that's a little bit better group. Great standard deviation number of 6.4, and the brass looks awesome. Nothing to complain about. Last up with the game changer is 26.5. All right, so the game changer wasn't terrible. We made it all the way up to 2897 feet per second. We had pretty decent standard deviation numbers across the board, like it's all good. So it's not quite as good as it was in the last video when we were shooting 2.4 inches of overall length, but still not too shabby. All right, one more bullet to test, and that is the 95 grain uh, nozzle ballistic tip. We're bumping our charge weights down by one grain, so 24.9 grains is first. See how it does. All right, that's a good start. Velocity 2678, the brass looks good. Remember, these uh, 95 grain loads are with Hornady brass, and it's holding up well. Awesome standard deviation of 4.2. Extreme spread on that was 10 feet per second. So that's very good stuff. Next up, 25.2. All right, I'm liking what I'm seeing here with the 95. Another halfway decent group, another great standard deviation number, 7.4. We've crossed over that 2,700 feet per second mark, so it's all good. Last up, 25.5 grains. All right, brass still looks good there at 25.5 grains with the 95 grain nozzle ballistic tip. We had one shot there that was up at 2767 that kind of screwed up our standard deviation number. Our extreme spread was 49 that time, but it was just that one shot. All the others were uh, pretty close to one another. So a pretty good day on the range. Let's get back to the bench, talk it all out. All right, so I feel obligated to show you some brass here because we just got off the range, but there's nothing at all to show you. I mean, seriously, they all look good. If there are, you know, a couple minor extractor marks or something, it's a lot like we saw previously where it's just, you got to get it in the light, just the right angle, and it, it's, it's no brass damage whatsoever. Same deal with some Hornady. Yeah, this is, I guess, the first time we've really pushed things with Hornady, and it held up just as good. So I'm very happy with both brands of brass so far. We'll see how these primer pockets feel, you know, now that we've fired them twice. Got to keep an eye out for loosening primer pockets, but so far so good. Everything's great. Let's move on. All right, so now it's time to have a look at some groups, and the results today were just kind of mediocre. We tested four bullets, and each one shot one group that was under an inch. So only four groups under an inch out of 13. I expect better out of this gun. I think our worst shooting bullet was the first one, the 90 grain ballistic tip. Those first two groups were a little bit ugly, and then we switched to the 90 grain ELDX and things were a little bit better. The game changer was a bit of a mixed bag. Like those first two groups where we shot one with the Starline brass and the other with the Hornady brass, like both of those groups were pretty bad. But then it turned it around and the next two groups were pretty good. So that's hopefully a good sign. But the 95 grain ballistic tip was pretty promising. So not too bad. Like I feel like we can tighten these up a little bit. Velocities were great. 
I was looking in some of the manuals and you know, we're right up there just barely below six millimeter BR velocities. So we're probably pushing this a little bit harder than we should. We're probably over pressure. And if I was working up a load where I was going to shoot a bunch of them, like a range load, it would probably be smart to back off of these numbers a little bit. Maybe with the 90 grainers go with 2750 to 2800. But for a hunting load like this, where we're not going to shoot that many, like, you know, as long as the gun seems to be functioning okay and our brass is doing okay, like, I don't know. Might as well push it as far as we can. So maybe we can settle in on a 90 grain load at around 2850 feet per second. And maybe the 95 grainer, we can go to maybe 2750. I don't know. We'll see where it settles out. So that's about it for the target. Now let's move on to what I consider to be the most important thing right now. And that is the seating die problems I ran into during my loading. So let me rearrange the camera here. All right, so this is the uh, sizing die that White Oak had sent all torn apart. This is the Forster Bentress seating die. This is the seating stem that makes contact with the bullet. This is one of the 90 grain nozzle ballistic tip bullets we've been shooting. And if we put it down in there, you'll see there's, it's not making good contact. Like a really good bullet uh, stem fit is gonna cradle that bullet and you're not even gonna be able to wiggle it. So this is, this is really bad. And what I've run into, it, it goes all the way back to the beginning when I started loading these, but I've kind of had to pick my battles here. Like this is a short series. I was trying not to get off on too many side stories or bring up too many things that we needed to chase down just because I need to get this upper back to White Oak in a, in a timely manner. And the more things I bring up, the more complicated it gets. But when you see one of these bullets, you can actually see a little scuff mark there where that seating die was making primary contact with the bullet as I was just, you know, messing around with it there for a few minutes. It's just right there. It's a pretty thin part of the jacket. So what I was getting is bullet deformation right there. Really bad bullet deformation at times. And let me just run, run you through the rest of the bullets. Like this is the 90 grain ELDX, just as bad if not worse. Although this bullet hasn't given me so much problems with uh, bullet deformation. The, the two nozzle bullets have been the worst and I, I think it's just because the jackets are maybe thinner or something, but this guy's not fitting well. This is the 90 grain game changer, not good. Here's the 95 grain ballistic tip, pretty bad. This is the new 103 grain uh, ELDX that we haven't shot yet. That's not good. And here's the 107 grain Sierra Match King. And it's not good. So whatever bullet this seating die is supposed to fit well, it's nothing we're interested in. None of the, our test bullets fit this seating stem properly. I assume maybe the lighter stuff that we're not really covering in this video series, maybe it fits those, I don't know. But it's a terrible fit for these. We've talked about this a little bit in the past on my channel. Like, I don't at one point we had chucked up a bullet in a drill with some gr grinding compound and tried to grind the seating stem to a better fit. That worked a little bit. A lot of people have reported success with epoxy. Like, yeah, here's some five minute epoxy. We fill that full of epoxy. We take our favorite bullet and press it down in there and let the epoxy dry. I've never personally tried that but I was about to do it with this one. You can see I pulled out the epoxy. It was ready to, get ready to go. But this die doesn't belong to me. And the other problem is like the epoxy trick is really best when you've got that favorite bullet that you definitely want to fit perfect. Well, I'm shooting a lot of different bullets with some pretty different ogive shapes. You know, we are like, this is the 90 grain uh, nozzle ballistic tip next to the 90 grain game changer. Like the, the, that's very, very different. So if I use epoxy with the, the uh, ballistic tip, it's not gonna be deep enough and then our tip is probably gonna hit whenever we go to the 95 grain game changer. Maybe, maybe I could have used the game changer or the, the 107 Sierra Match King, I don't know. But I just worried about screwing it up. So here's what I've done. I, I bought a die and I even paid for overnight shipping to get it here. This is a six millimeter Hornady seating die one of their standard custom grade dies. They're like 30 bucks. There are a couple things I really like about these dies. When you're talking about Forster, which I, I've, I own a lot of Forster uh, seating dies. The Forster Ultra Micrometer seating die was my favorite for a long time. And I've, I've I own like six of them, I think. 
But what I started running, I started running into seating stem problems. Like here's my 223 die that's all torn apart. And the reason is uh, if I can find which one it was. One of these came with the die and then the other one, I think it was either, I think it was sent to me by Forster as a replacement. See how the one on the right is much thinner than the one on the left. Well, this was the one that had originally come in the, in the uh, die and it was working great. But the problem was that it was so thin that it cracked on me. I really need to pull out my macro lens to get you a good view of it. But somewhere around here is a crack. There we go. I marked it with ink from my pen right next to it. So just to the left of my, there's, that's my ink mark. You might see a little hairline crack. If I can get this stupid camera to focus. And the problem is, let me see if I can open it up a little bit with a bullet. There you go. You see how it opened up? So when you're seating a bullet, the seating stem was constantly flexing open. And whatever, I don't know. I don't want to get too deep into this. But I started having, having seating stem problems. And I cracked a stem in my 300 blackout version as well. Well, my first experience with these Hornady dies was with 6.5 Creedmoor. Whenever I got into that cartridge, I decided to go with Hornady dies because, you know, 6.5 Creedmoor is one of their cartridges. So I figured I'd let them show me what they had on some die sets. And I really, really ended up liking their dies. There's your seating stem. And then this is the lower part. Now, the, the biggest difference between a Forster die and one of these Hornady's, which it's a, it's a big advantage of the Forster die. The spring loaded part at the bottom that moves is like a, a whole chamber. It takes the whole case. So during the seating operation, the entire case is supported and aligned with your seating stem. So it makes for a very good and precise seating operation. Well, in the Hornady, all it supports is the neck. That's all that goes into the die. So the neck gets supported kind of decent. And you can see like this six millimeter version with this sized piece of our WOA brass, it's not even a particularly uh, tight fit. So big advantage to Forster there. However, what I like about the Hornady's are the seating stems and the availability of other seating stems. So this is the one that came with it. I also went ahead and picked up this one, which is a custom one for the uh, 108 grain ELD match and Amax. Now we're not shooting that bullet, but I figured between, I don't know, the standard one that came with it and this one might give us two options to find the best fit we can. Now these don't have any markings on them. So as soon as I took this one out of the package, I dunked it into some cold blue <laughs> so that I'd be able to tell them apart. So that's why the, yeah, the upper part is blued there. Now custom seating stems are available from just about anybody, no matter what die manufacturer you like, but man with Hornady, they're, they're very, available and easy to get a hold of. So that's what I decided to go with was the Hornady plus an extra stem plus something they call their micro just seating micrometer. This is an additional 25 bucks or something like that. And it turns your cheap die into a micrometer adjustable seating die. And they work really nicely. Now the good thing is you can switch your micro just seating stem thingy between your different dies and all that stuff. I decided to go ahead and buy another one because my other one, I let it get rusty. And also the older version didn't have, uh, the numbers weren't black and they were hard to see. So this one's really nice and easy to see. And I needed another one anyway, whatever. Sometimes it gets annoying switching them back and forth between dies. Okay, the last thing I love about these dies is like I was mentioning how they only go that far in, well, they're universal by caliber. So this is gonna work with any six millimeter cartridge I decide to shoot in the future. So I can use it for six PPC or something if I don't want to use my Arbor Press for that cartridge. They're universal. And at this point, this kind of completes my collection. I've got them for 22 caliber and 6.5 millimeter and 30 caliber. So I can cover everything I want to do with my Hornady seating dies. Now, the real question though is, okay, are these seating stems a better fit? It's not quite as perfect as I was hoping. This is the 90 grain ballistic tip. Still a little bit of wobble. Loads better than the other one, but still not quite perfect. This is the uh, the second stem, and it kind of has a similar amount of wobble. A little bit better, but not quite perfect. If we move on to the 90 grain ELD X, that's a pretty good fit. Not quite perfect, but pretty good. This is, remember this stem 
was for the 108 grain ELD match. So it's pretty close, not perfect. The other one is similar, maybe a little bit worse. So that's good. Our 90 grain game changer is a real nice fit in the stem that came with the die. And the other one is pretty close. The difference between these is not gigantic. Like the bullets that fit one generally fit pretty decent in the other. But unfortunately the nozzles are our worst fit. The 90 and the 95 don't really fit either one very well. I think they've got the same ogive anyway. So that might be something we do. Maybe we'll sacrifice the this stem and maybe do the epoxy trick with the nozzle, make it a custom nozzle stem, I don't know. Now moving on, the 103 grain ELDX is pretty much a perfect fit in the 108 ELD stem. Really nice, but it's pretty darn good in the other one as well. Yeah, pretty good. At first when I was testing these, I really thought these were the same. And maybe they are, I don't know. But I do notice some differences with a couple of the bullets, but I may have ended up just buying two copies of the same one. The 107 Sierra Match King is perfect. And here's in the ELD stem. Yep, it's perfect in that one as well. So that's the plan moving forward. Now, the reason this caused so much of a problem or why I was so worried about it, it not only affects like your bullet, the integrity of your bullet, right? If you end up with a big ring around your bullet where it's distorted, well, it screws up your overall length and your cartridge-based ogive measurements and even your cartridge-based bullet tip measurements start varying wildly. And some of the groups I shot today, like the five rounds, had as much as a 10 thousandths difference in cartridge-based ogive measurement. That's not a good thing when you're after accuracy. You want everyone to be right on the number. So I'm hoping with a Hornady die and the better fitting stems, in the next video, we're gonna be loading more accurate ammo. Hopefully this was the cause of some of our mediocre groups today. So I think that's probably where we'll leave this one. In the next video, there are a couple things I wanna do. We're gonna move on and play with some heavy stuff. The 103 ELDX and the 107 Match King. We're gonna see what sort of velocity numbers we can get with those. And another thing I wanna do, back to accuracy. If you've noticed, I haven't been shooting this gun suppressed at all. I was gonna do both, you know, like I almost always shoot suppressed and a lot of people give me a hard time about it. But this gun's pretty gassy. Like if I was gonna have this gun long term, I would probably put an adjustable gas block on it. So I worry about getting even more over gassed if we go with the suppressor route. We may screw the Harrell's tuner brake on there. This is a 6.5 millimeter brake, but it ought to work, I don't know, halfway decent. It's got, eh, I can't get them loose right now, but it's got adjustable weights that move back and forth and kind of let you tune it in a little bit. We might screw this on and just see what happens. Right now, the gun has just got a standard A2 flash hider on it. And we might try this and see if it uh, changes things. So that's it. That's where we'll leave this one. I'll see you guys in the next one.